Welcome, everybody, and thanks for joining us for one in a series of multiple podcasts that we're recording for companies in the technology industry, particularly for those that either have global operations or are considering international expansion. My name is Will Billups. I lead our ASC 740 and IAS 12 practice firm-wide, and today we have two wonderful guests joining us. We have Rajesh Tripathi and Kirk Hesser, both from our international tax practice, Rajesh specializes in international planning, provision, and compliance, and Kirk specializes in transfer pricing, transaction structuring, and planning. I'll kick it over to them for a quick introduction. Thank you, Will. This is uh, Rajesh Tripathi. I'm part of the Cherry Beckett family. I've been doing U.S. international tax outbound, inbound for the last 25 plus years, helping technology companies do IP planning, cross-border M&A, due diligence, U.S. international tax compliance, and any provision-related matters. I'm going to hand it over to Kirk. Over to you, Kirk. My name is Kirk Hester. I am part of the Cherry Becker family as well and specialized in international tax, more specifically transfer pricing. I've been with uh, Cherry Becker for five plus years and have been doing transfer pricing for 25 plus years. I help technology uh, companies structure their intercompany transactions, both from a planning perspective as well as the compliance perspective. And particularly if uh, something comes up in controversy or if they get audited from a transfer pricing perspective. Excellent. Thank you both so much for that thorough introduction. Today on the podcast series, we would like to go through some sets of facts that I have and get your thoughts on some of these pieces that we should be integrating into our planning. I have a company that has internally developed intellectual property and is primarily U.S. based. This company is looking to expand their operations internationally in various jurisdictions, leveraging the intellectual property created and used in the U.S. business. My first question for you two is, my client has acquired a foreign group. What things should be considered to protect their intellectual property? So why don't I go first, Bill? I think um, this is one of the common questions that I have seen whenever a U.S. company, you know, uh, is looking at uh, and they have an IP sitting over here, whether it's a small or a mid-sized company. They have developed an internal IP and they are trying to see, hey, how can I expand globally? I want to target customers across the outside U.S. And how can I look at, you know, serving my you know, clients uh, outside U.S. and sell my product outside U.S. So this is where they will have to start thinking about that. Hey, if I go in a foreign country, is my IP protected? How can I protect my IP when my customer starts using it? And that's where the IP planning has something that they should start think, considering, you know. And most of the time, the uh, they are always thinking about, hey, my IP is protected in the U.S., so therefore it's universally protected, you know, but that's not the case. In fact, uh, there are certain steps that a company will have to take when they are going global as they're trying to expand globally. For example, the company's biggest asset is their IP and the goodwill, which is 90% of the value they own. So therefore, they have to start thinking about it. If I'm going to go global, what is my first thing that I should start thinking about? And that's where protection of your IP globally. And then the second thing they should start thinking about is what is going to be my global tax position or my global tax impact. If somebody is using the IP outside US, what should I do as a part of you know uh, my tax impact for the use of the IP. And that's where you have to start thinking about, hey, should I do my IP planning strategically so that should I move my IP to a high tax country or should I start looking at a country where I can, uh, you know, have my IP used and there's a lower withholding in the high and basically my location is not going to be high tax location for me. That's the first thing that they will have to start thinking and planning around. The second thing that the company should think about is, hey, if I'm going to be, you know, setting my IP or setting a legal entity in a foreign country and then having uh, an R&D center and also a local customer to serve, to support on the sales and marketing of use of my IP. If I'm going to be doing the R&D services, does it make sense for me to set up my IP where I should start thinking about putting a transfer pricing in place? Because if you have an R&D center in the country where you're expanding and you're also going to start having a local customers to leverage your IP, do sales and marketing, you have to look at two aspects. One is your IP planning, 
and making sure that our army that is parked in the foreign country, the local country does not get access, comes forward and says, hey, I have the right to the IP because you are developing the IP in my country. That's the first thing you have to consider. The second thing you have to consider is when the customer is, you're licensing your IP, you're sub-licensing your IP to a customer in a foreign country. How do you protect your IP? And what is the withholding tax that will get triggered around that? So that's where the transfer pricing and supply chain of the IP planning is very, very important. The third thing I've seen is that companies should start thinking about is a lot of times companies want to expand globally, but they're not ready to consider setting up a legal entity. Then they say that, hey, should we think of having a consultant in a foreign country to help us develop the IP or software development or R&D center, you know, by using a consultant rather than having a legal entity? That's where the con company should start thinking about, hey, do I have to consider a permanent establishment exposure? If there is a consultant sitting in a foreign country and accessing my server and doing the R&D development. And also, how do you structure your ownership or planning of your, you know, uh, uh, supply chain and the transfer pricing? And at this point, I would like Kirk to step in and talk about, hey, when a company is shifting their IP or setting up their legal entity, what kind of transfer pricing planning they should consider to mitigate the risk of a lower tax implication, withholding tax implication and protecting their IP? Over to you, Kirk. Um, over top of everything that Raj just stated, the company needs to think about its transfer pricing, planning, and compliance. When you're talking about intellectual property and related parties using or benefiting from intellectual property, you're really talking about licensing the IP or entering into some type of a cost-sharing framework where the related parties would co-develop the IP going forward, and that may eliminate the need for royalties. Otherwise, you're really talking about licensing IP to the related parties, and all of this that I just described has to be done on an arm's length basis, meaning the royalties that are put in place or any cost sharing framework has to be done in accordance to, in the US, the 482 regulations or typically outside or generally outside the US that would be according to the OECD guidelines. And really we're talking about whether you wanna centralize your IP ownership or decentralize your IP ownership, depending on what the company's tax and business objectives are. But in any case, along with what we originally stated in protecting the IP, what is also important is putting together uh, intercompany agreements that really spell out the rights of the related parties in these intercompany transactions that are using and benefiting from the IP. So there's a lot to think about here, but on top of it all, the transfer pricing has to meet the standards in both the US and outside the US, um, you know, to, uh, based on where the IP is being used. This was very helpful. Thank you both for the thorough response. There are some ASC 740 and IAS 12 implications from where the intangible and goodwill are parked for purchase accounting purposes. And it is my understanding as well that when you structure these transactions, you want the most tax efficient structure in place. There may be some liquidations or entity movement that needs to occur as you're working through this deal sometimes the actions can be taken prior to the actual close of the transaction sometimes they'll be part of a structuring afterwards i think that's vital to note that from an uncertain tax position perspective we've got to analyze the transfer pricing and use of the ip in place across multiple cross-border countries and jurisdictions so that's important to understand what the position is where we're going and whether or not there's something uncertain related to those from a tax provision perspective my client currently has intellectual property situated in the U.S., but the development is happening in foreign countries by hiring independent consulting firms to act as the employer of record. What are the implications of this? So let me step back over here and uh, talk about this. You know, when whenever you have the U.S. company hiring consultants in a foreign country, and they use an employment record. The issue that they do not address is that, uh, hey, when the person they hire, even though they're not the employer on, re employer on record, it's a third party vendor in the local country. But keep in mind that the consultant who is in the local country accessing your server is basically creating a fixed place P, which is your permanent establishment 
in the local country for the U.S. entity because that person is access, accessing the server of the U.S. parent company, working on the software development under direction and guidance of the U.S. parent of the U.S. entity. So keeping in mind that the direction, the vision, and the guidance is given by the U.S. company, that could trigger a P risk for the U.S. company in that local country. That's the first thing that they have to start thinking about that, hey, what is my P risk if I start this kind of a model where I hire consultants in a foreign country to do the software development? The second thing that the company has to start thinking about is that the person who's who he or she is working in a foreign country is writing the codes for my next generation of IP. And tomorrow if that person gets picked up for an audit in the local country because the person is receiving a foreign source income from the US through the PU firm in that local country, the local government may come back and say, hey, you are developing a future software of the IP is, and that development is happening in my country because the fixed place is sitting is in my country. Therefore, that future development, the IP rights are sitting in the local country and we have the rights to that. So that's where the risk the companies are taking that you don't want a foreign country to come and claim rights to your IP on the future development that's happening by the company hiring a local consultant through a PEO firm. That's the first aspect that they have to consider. The second thing they should start thinking about is that, does it make sense for me to set up a local entity over there? Because if I'm gonna hire uh, multiple you know, consultants in multiple countries in Europe or Asia, I should start thinking, of me, thinking about maybe having my legal presence over there and then hiring on my own employees to mitigate that risk. And lastly, I'm going to hand it over to Kurt to talk about the transfer pricing issue around that, because even though you're hiring a consultant and you're creating a risk for your US IP, which could be uh, you know, accessible to a foreign country that they can come and claim, but what's the transfer pricing issue that you should consider as a part of this planning? Sure. Thanks, Raj. And, and I think we see this often, this comes up, particularly when you do set up an entity in a foreign location that is participating in intellectual property development. And, and this is where we really need to talk about legal ownership of IP versus tax ownership of IP. Um, legal ownership of IP is obviously in the U.S. and that's where the legal, the, in this case, is the IP is legally owned in the U.S. However, if you are developing IP in an entity offshore and that entity is funding the IP development, managing the IP development and or has some risk in that IP development, tax authorities will claim ownership, to, at least from a tax perspective, of that IP. So you have to be very careful to set up your development of IP in this case and make sure that it is paid for manage and all of the IP risks it's in the US if you want to maintain both legal and tax ownership in the US in this case so that you are paying that foreign entity uh, in most cases some type of a cost plus to develop that IP and you retain ownership from a tax and legal perspective um, in this case in the US as that's where you want the, the IP to be located. And I'll add one more thing over here because a lot of times, uh, Will, what I have seen is when companies are do not have you know presence in a foreign country, and they go hire consultants outside U.S. They will also hire you know sometimes I've seen that they'll say hey we'll hire a senior technology officer or chief technology officer in law in a foreign country as a consultant, and that creates another risk for them. Because the moment you hire a chief technology officer in a foreign country without having a legal presence and you're using a PEO firm, a third party you know, firm to act as an employer and record, then that CTO will absolutely trigger that will trigger some kind of an IP risk for you. And the local country may come back and claim the rights to the IP because the brainchild of that IP is sitting in the local country. And I've seen that in a few of my instances with some of my clients where they will be headquartered in the US and they say that the IP is parked over here because we are doing all the you know, cost sharing of the uh, software development. But then the chief technology officer, they will go ahead and hire that in a foreign country because they don't find that you know, talent over here. So this is another risk that they have to mitigate and they have to consider to avoid the IP ownership to shift in a foreign country just because the chief technology officer is hired in a foreign country. This is very helpful, Rajesh and Kurt. This is important from 
a tax perspective because a branch operation is very different from the treatment of a controlled foreign corporation. This can impact not only your financial statement reporting, but also your income tax returns. And there are guilty implications from this as well for your U.S. taxation. So I think it's very important that companies understand what that what risk is associated with this permanent establishment and what risk if there is a selection of tax ownership by that jurisdiction. Some companies inherit entities in other countries, and sometimes according to that, there's poorly planned or unplanned transfer pricing that really isn't in place. What should be considered in the instance where a company inherits an entity in a foreign country? I think we think we see this quite commonly um, as a result of acquisitions where you inherit a company in a foreign location which has um, IP, uh, which is very important. And one of the primary reasons that you uh, acquired the company and it, now you've now you've got yourself IP in multiple locations. And um, in this case, you might have IP in the US and you might have IP in a foreign location. Um, and, and, you know, that might go against what the company is trying to do in terms of centralizing IP. So then the question may become, um, you know, post acquisition, trying to move that IP from the foreign jurisdiction to the U.S. jurisdiction, which can be costly from a tax perspective and very complex. Um, at the same time, if you don't move that IP with IP in multiple locations, then you may have uh, royalties that may be crossing jurisdictions in both ways since you have IP use usage by both uh, both entities or multiple entities in the chain. So uh, one of the things that we try to do is, uh, you know, get ahead of all this or um, you know, get ahead of an acquisition in terms of planning it and where you want the IP to be post acquisition and try to solve that, uh, you know, within the acquisition itself, as opposed to trying to detangle it uh, post acquisition um, when it gets costly to move IP and uh, very complex to do so. And I also add uh, from the international tax perspective, you know, whenever you are acquiring a company or you have IP sitting outside in a foreign country that was part of your, you know, uh, strategy to grow, uh, make sure that you, you know, uh, understand the supply chain and how do you protect your IP because that is equally important because you may have an IP sitting here in the U.S., you may have an IP sitting in, let's say, for a discussion purposes in Germany, and then your customer who's sitting in France could be using the IP in both the countries to, you know, and you're selling that IP, how do you structure your withholding tax? How do you structure your sub-licensing of the IP to that customer sitting in France? And then what is the withholding tax aspect between the treaty that US has with France, with, you know, uh, Germany, where the IP is parked? And then what, uh, you know, uh, how can you minimize your withholding tax around that? So that's where you'll have to start thinking about doing the supply chain proactively doing your proper IP planning and minimizing your tax liability. Uh, so something that we should always keep in mind, you know, that to avoid withholding tax uh, taxes. And when I say avoid is that try to do a tax strategy of reducing, minimizing your withholding tax by looking at the double tax treaties that U.S. has and how to do the supply chain so you minimize your, you know, risk of uh, withholding tax liability and also making sure that you're not paying taxes in multiple jurisdictions, you know, in Germany, in France, and in the U.S. That's very helpful, and that is obviously going to impact your overall ETR related to the withholding taxes, but also what your posture is for your overall ETR, where you're shifting the tax between jurisdictions. Some may be high-rate jurisdictions and some may be low-rate jurisdictions. What are the implications and what are the risks that are associated with a multinational looking to leverage intellectual property to customers for customer use? So the one risk I'm going to allude again or reiterate myself, you know, that uh, whenever they're you're having a customer in a foreign country access the IP, the first thing you'll have to start thinking about is that where is the IP parked? Where is the software development happening of the IP? And uh, is the IP all centered in the US? And then you're trying to have a customer in, let's say, in India to access the IP and use the IP, then how do you do your supply chain so that tomorrow your IP is protected 
and you have proper agreement arrangement so that the customer in India does not validate the IP or copies the IP. So you have to do a proper ring fencing around that. You know, the second thing is that you should also start thinking about that. If the IPs are going to be used in a foreign country by your customer, does it make sense to put some kind of a blocker, uh, a holding company structure in between, maybe some tax, uh, you know, strategy structure like the US has a very good tax treaty network with Netherlands or with UK. And if you route that from, say, your customers or your IP to sublicense it from the US to UK and then from UK to India, maybe you could minimize your withholding tax around that, you know, and you can have a good tax, effective tax rate planning and withholding tax rate planning around that. So whenever you are accessing your, trying to have access customers outside US and sell your, uh, you know, so services or sales and services to the customers to use the IP, ring fencing your effective tax rate on the withholding tax and strategizing which is a good treaty network is very, very important. And in addition to that, the transfer pricing plays an important role as well, where Kirk will talk and highlight some more things around that, you know. I think the main thing to consider when, when you are, uh, as Raj suggested, putting IP or having customers use IP, and then you start to put holding company structures in place or blockers in place or entities in place in foreign countries to either sub-license IP, um, the main thing you need to think about is all of those cross charges or royalties for those sub licenses have to be done on an arm's length basis. And um, to accomplish all this, also important to have proper intercompany agreements in place, as Raj already touched on, to spell out the rights and uh, of the usage of the IP. And all of that uh, is important. All of the documentation, transfer pricing documentation, intercompany agreements are very important in terms of demonstrating the arms length nature of your intercompany transactions, but also to protect your IP. Rajesh, Kurt, thanks for this wonderful conversation. I know we just kind of scratched the surface when it comes to intellectual property planning for tech companies' global operations. I want to reiterate to our audience that we have a full team here at Cherry Becker that can help you address these issues, and we're always happy to help. You can find our contact information in the description of this episode or visit cbh.com backslash international. Thank you all for tuning in today. We hope you'll join us for the next episode. See you soon.